Back in the summer of 2013, I uh, flew out to the West Coast to preach for a friend of mine, and it was just one of those days. You ever had one of those days where it just seemed like everything goes wrong? Well, that's, that's what happened. My flights were delayed. Uh, when I did get on the flights, I realized I didn't have a hotel reservation for that first night. And in addition to that, when I got on the plane, they said, we don't have any Wi-Fi on this plane because we had to switch planes because it was late. And as a result of that, I couldn't make a hotel reservation. I got to California, and my cell phone was dead. And so I drove to an area where I knew there were some hotels, and I parked in between two different hotels where I could just walk to them and find out which one had the better price. And I went to one, and I got the price. And then as I'm walking back past uh, my rental car to go to the other one, I realized that there's a bunch of glass next to my car. And I realized that there's a gaping hole in my passenger window. And they, had, someone had broken in and had taken my backpack out. It was then that I realized that my, my backpack had my laptop computer in it. And it also had my iPhone in it. And it had my Bible and some other things in there. And oh yeah, it had my wallet in there. And so I had absolutely nothing. And so I, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I bum a phone to borrow to call the police to find out where their police station is. And I, I go to the police station. And uh, as soon as I go walking in, I said, hey, I said, I'm the, I'm the guy who called here. I just got robbed. And uh, I said, uh, I, I need to see if I can use your phone so I can call my wife and get my credit card stopped. He said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't use our phone. And he said, that, that's against our policy. And I said, well, you know, if, if I were a criminal, you'd, you'd let me have one phone call. <laughs> he didn't think that was funny. Uh, and so I spent some more time with him there. And I said, hey, I said, you got a pay phone anywhere? He said, oh, yeah. He said, we've got a pay phone right across the street, right there on that corner. I said, great, I'll go over and use it. He said, oh, you can't use it. I said, well, why not? He said, it's too dangerous. He said, this is a bad neighborhood. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I said, I'm 30 feet from the police station. No, he said, I can't let you use that. Well, I spent an hour with that guy as we went through all sorts of different things. And, and when it was done, when I, when I left and I drove back 30 minutes to the airport to get a rental car that didn't have glass pieces blowing in my face, I, I, I thought this has been one of those days. And you can relate. You've had days like that. They're frustrating ones. It might be something mundane or you get stopped at every traffic light or your gas tank just seems like it lives on E or maybe your phone wireless won't work, or your waitress that you have at the restaurant is oblivious to your requests, and you just feel like everything's going wrong. But then sometimes it's not the mundane things, it's the monumental things. It's when your doctor looks at you and says, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's terminal. It's when your teenager shouts at you, I hate you. It's when your spouse looks at you and says, I'm done. Whether it's monumental or mundane, you reach a point where it feels like just life isn't fair and the world is against you. And today's title is, What God Can Do When Things Go Wrong. And my guess is that there's not a person here who, who doesn't need this. I mean, if your life is perfect in every aspect and, and you literally never have any problems and your life couldn't get any better, then I, I don't have anything to offer for you today. But if you at times struggle and question, and doubt, and get frustrated over the circumstances of your life, then, then maybe this story from the Gospels can be a source of encouragement to you. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the very first miracle in the, the life of Jesus. And we're going to learn that when things seem the darkest, that's when Jesus can shine the brightest. Because God always has a, a better option for us. And we have to be willing to trust his plan and do what he says. The story is found in John chapter 2. It's the story of the wedding feast where Jesus is going to turn water into wine. And today I'm going to have you stand, if you would, and uh, we're going to listen to this scripture being read. So stand with me, and we'll just uh, respect God's word in this way today by listening as, as I read from John 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. 
Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. It's actually a respectful term, like saying the word ma'am today. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Now I want you to read with me in unison. Join with me. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. You can be seated. This was a a major event. This was a wedding, and weddings always have some type of drama associated with them. I, I don't know if you, if you are a, a mom or dad or grandma, have you ever had your son or daughter uh, get married? Just put your hand up if you've experienced this. And you know the pressures that go with this, right? And uh, there's a lot of potential for drama. It's the wedding coordinator who thinks that your budget is merely a suggestion and not a reality. It's the drama of the outdoor wedding Is it going to rain or is it just going to be burning hot? So will grandpa get soaked or will grandma pass out, right? (laughs) It's the anxiety from wondering, will the parents get along when, when it is that they walk in? Will they bring their new spouse with them? Will they create a scene? Do you start saving 2% of your income each year when your daughter turns 10? Or do you opt to impulsively rob a bank after she announces her engagement? (laughs) June is the month for weddings, and I'll be honest with you, if a preacher is given the choice to either do a funeral or do a wedding, I always choose a funeral. One less person to complain. Uh, (laughs) Just being honest, all right? But here's the situation. In John chapter 2, the service goes great. And now it's time to celebrate. But back then, it wasn't just an evening reception. It was a week-long reception. And people would come and go. And and the more people who came, the more planning and the more coordination that it actually took to pull it off. I used to think that in in John 2, as the chapter opens, that, that this wedding took place on the third day of the week. Because that's the way it reads in, in our English translations. But the more I've studied it, There are a lot of Bible scholars that feel like it's actually meaning that this is day three of the week-long wedding celebration. And it makes more sense, rather than them running out of wine on the very first night uh, of a seven-day celebration. And evidently, the master of the banquet was deficient in his planning of the beverage amount. So either he was terrible at math, or the glasses that they were using were way too big. Now, I've had two daughters get married, and they both chose different settings. One had an intimate outdoor destination wedding with 90 guests. The other one had a larger church wedding with 2,100 guests. And this past week, I went back and I pulled out those file folders of those, and I just was looking at the cost and the bills and and crying, and... uh, (laughs) I looked at the larger one, and I saw that we serve country time lemonade, and the notation next to it said this, planning for enough lemonade for 2,100 people, but preparing for 2,436 so that we don't run out of lemonade. Now, I admit, lemonade is a whole lot cheaper than wine, but they share a common denominator. Both of them have the ability to be diluted if the reception is more popular than expected. A few years ago, I was driving uh, down Shelbyville Road, and I nearly wrecked my car. Uh, Saw this sign at a Walgreens. 
Ja. I cannot tell you how many text messages I got that day. And uh, I don't drink, but uh, two for 10 bucks, that is, that is an embarrassment to my family name, all right? <laughs> and in Jesus' day, the wine that people drank was two to three parts water and one part wine. And it was the banquet master's responsibility to make certain that the wine wasn't too potent causing the guests to get drunk, which would ruin the seven-day experience. And they also were in charge of regulating the diluting of the wine so they wouldn't run out. So if you saw that it looked like you were going to run out of wine, then you just started adding a little bit more water to stretch it. And Mary sees what's taking place, and she comes to Jesus to try to avoid this, avoid this social misstep for this family. Mary knew Jesus' identity and his ability, and she wants him to do something about it. But Jesus' reply is, my time has not yet come. What does Jesus mean by that? My time has not yet come. Well, maybe he's being diplomatic. Mom, we're just guests at the wedding, and when things go wrong, it's not our rightful place to stick our nose in somebody else's business. But by his wording, I think Jesus realizes things will change for him when people see his miraculous power. This is the first of several different times in John's gospel where Jesus says, my time has not yet come. And every time Jesus says, my time has not yet come, he is referring to the cross. Because he knows why he's on earth. And he knows he's gonna have to pay for our sins. So saying that his time has not yet come, Jesus in a way is figuratively acknowledging that once I start doing miracles in the public eye, the road to the cross has begun and I will be on a collision course with Calvary. And notice Mary doesn't say another word to Jesus. She simply says to the servants at the celebration, do whatever he says to do. And Jesus is within earshot and overhears that. Usually there's a method to the madness in the way a mom motivates. And this is a strong declaration by Mary of her extraordinary faith that he had the power to do anything. She's not forcing her will on her 30-year-old son. And instead, she's concerned for this family. And they must have been a close family and friends because they've walked eight miles to be there. And the fact that Jesus was invited and the disciples were invited, a lot of people think that maybe it was a relative of Mary's, perhaps her sister or a cousin uh, that was being married. And Mary knows there's someone there who can help. There is someone who can save the day and help them save face by displaying his divinity. Now, I think the Lord loves intervening at just the right time, in big ways and even in small ways. He just likes to show that he cares about us. He just likes to show up in our situations. He likes to show up in our, our circumstances. Back in 2013, when I was out west, and a uh, day and a half after I had had all my belongings stolen, I'd been navigating through all of the hassle of closing out credit cards and debit cards and starting the process of replacing things. And I'd been praying, okay, Lord, uh, I don't have a driver's license or any ID, and I'm going to need that if I'm ever going to fly back to Kentucky. And on that Sunday afternoon, the police got word to me that a garbage man in San Francisco found my backpack. And my driver's license was still in the backpack, along with a few other things. And in those moments when you feel God just uh, gives you a wink or he gives you this encouragement, it underscores that he's not just a powerful God, he's a personal God. You ever been in a situation like Mary was, a circumstance where there was nothing that you could do, you couldn't do anything, only Jesus could, and so you begged for his intervention and you begged for his involvement? We have a group text message among our elders and we share prayer requests from within the church sometimes with one another. This past week, we were praying for a young lady in the church who had two spots on her breast and the doctors were quite concerned that they were cancerous. And uh, on Thursday afternoon, one of the elders sent out a text 
that said the, the woman had just met with the doctors and gotten a more thorough report, and it said, all clear, praise be to God. And right after that, the text just started flying. In less than a minute, I think every one of these texts came through. Awesome, just awesome, praise the Lord. Praise God, that is so good to hear. This is so awesome, praise him. Amen, what great news. That's awesome. Somebody else said, the power of prayer. Uh, praise God. Somebody else said, giving thanks. Steve Brown wrote, that is awesome, but I'm not surprised. God is so good. And in your situation, it may be a, a minor frustration or it may be a major tragedy, but you've seen God's hand move when you needed it the most. And the timing of his intervention was perfect. And when that happens, I hope you'll take the time to praise him for twice as long as you petitioned him. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not saying that the scan will always be clear, that you'll always get your wallet back, that your salary will always increase, that everything is always going to be just the way you hope. It won't. But we each have been given glimpses when we can see the hand of God and we just say, thank you, Lord. We praise you. You're never late. You're never early. You show up at just the right time in our situation. Maybe not the right time when we think it would be, but you know when the right time is. And so we pray for patience, that elusive fruit of the Spirit that we want, and we want it now. <laughs> and yet God teaches us patience by making us wait. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, the King James Version says it like this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I want to point out two takeaways for us from Jesus' first miracle. Here's takeaway number one. Jesus can do better than you ever could in ways that you'd never expect. Jesus can do better than you ever could in ways that you'd never expect. Now, I don't say that like a school kid on the playground. Jesus is better than you. But he is. And Jesus starts off his three-year ministry in a way that you wouldn't expect. I mean, if I were writing the script for this story, water to wine, I mean, that isn't going to be the first miracle. A marketing or a PR specialist would have started with a big splash with Jesus raising five people from the dead in front of a huge crowd and the news would spread to every town east of the Jordan River. And yet Jesus chooses to first reveal his power outside of a kitchen at a wedding chapel. Why? Because he can see long term and not just in the moment. And Jesus realizes he first must deepen the devotion of the disciples before his ministry of miracles can move the masses. Micah chapter 7, verse 7. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Elsewhere in Isaiah, we read in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, he does better than we ever could in ways we'd never expect. Well, back to my story, I, I drove to the San Francisco Police Department, and I walked in, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Dave, I, I called, and I, you all said you have a backpack of mine, and I'm here to pick it up. And the guy said, that's great. First, I'm going to need to see some ID. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? And uh, I said, well, there's a problem there. I said, because I don't have any ID, and you told me my ID is in the backpack. And so I said, there's some sermons in there, so that can kind of prove it. If you look in there, and there's some sermons in there, no one else would have sermons in a backpack. And so uh, he eventually brought the backpack out to me, and uh, uh, sure enough, we started looking through, and all the money was gone from uh, my wallet, and the phone was gone, and laptop, and all those things, but my Bible was in there, and I was very excited uh, about that, and my sermons were in there, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're clapping for the Bible and not the sermons, I understand, right, uh, yeah, evidently not a lot of resale value on the sermons, so, uh, but the strange thing was, when this 
this guy broke through the window. Uh, he started bleeding, and so he bled over all of my stuff. So he got his blood over all of my stuff in there, my, my Bible, my letters, my envelopes, uh, the sermons, some books, all these different things. And that was a little bit weird, but I was still glad to have my Bible back. And on that initial night, when I first completed the police report, uh, the officer said, you're going to need to fill this document out with me. And he said, uh, you're going to have to try to remember everything you can that was in your backpack. So I'm that first night trying to rack my brain and go through, okay, what all was in that backpack? He said, then you got to tell me what the value is. So he said, uh, okay, uh, what, what do you got? And I said, well, I had a laptop computer. What's the value? And I tried to estimate that. Uh, iPhone, what's the value? Uh, earbuds, I had new earbuds in there. What's the value? I had a book I bought in the Atlanta airport to, to read on the flight. What's the value? And then I remembered what else was in there. And I said, my Bible. And he said, what's the value? And I looked at him and said, priceless. You know what your Bible's worth to you? It's like an old trusted friend. You've written in the margins. You know where things are on certain pages. How do you put a price tag on something like that? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. The grass withers, flowers fail, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. In the coming days, I tried to think, okay, what is it, God, that you are trying to teach me when things go wrong in my life like this? And I couldn't help but be struck by what was taken and also by what was left. And it's quite fitting that God removed my major source of communication, that he took away my phone, but he returned my Bible. And it was as if he was communicating to me, my word is more important than your iPhone. And I was out of town, uh, I was out of town working on sermons for a few days with this ministry friend of mine. I really needed my laptop. And it was like God was saying, my word is more important than your sermons. You see, here's the second takeaway. When things go wrong, Jesus is drawing you to him. That's what happened at this wedding celebration, and it's what happens in our lives today. And I'm thankful that Jesus' first miracle was something less spectacular in the world's eyes, and yet it was so important for a person, for a banquet host, and for a family. And this premier miracle is God telling us, hey, you don't have to be in a life or death situation to get my attention. I care about you. And God cares enough about us that our daily lives matter to him. And if we weren't important to the God of the universe, then he wouldn't even bother showing up in the small things. But he does. And we are. We're important to him. And so Jesus uses a normal day and a helpful, practical miracle to reveal his glory to his disciples. Look again at John 2, verse 11, the verse that you read earlier. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this first miracle is on a smaller stage, and because of the setting, it actually goes unnoticed by the guests. And it appears that the miracle is only witnessed by some servants and the banquet master and Mary and the disciples. And the scripture says that this revelation of Christ's power and glory caused his disciples to believe. And that's the desire of Jesus for everyone. That people will come to a radical, no holds barred, extraordinary faith and that they will believe in him. And perhaps Jesus wanted to encourage his family or save the reputation of the banquet host his main reason seems to be he wants to display his glory to his disciples so that they would put their faith and trust in him. But he knew the timing wasn't quite right to show the world what he could do. You know, Jesus can reveal his glory in the middle of your everyday life too. And he does it time and time again. Last week, many of you all came in here for the Father's Day service. And you had no idea that at the end of the service that as a dad, you were going to be down on your knees praying on these steps. And yet, at the end of that service, when I invited men to come down afterwards, 
There were people begging God, some of them sobbing before God, all of them kneeling, asking God to help them grow spiritually as a dad. That's the scene 10 minutes after the service is over last week. Some people just thought, there's just another week, this another routine week of coming to church. I come to church every week. And yet God shows up in our everyday lives, in our routine. And at this wedding feast, Jesus obviously did a miracle, but it wasn't a showstopper. It wasn't a crowd pleaser. It wasn't, Lazarus, come forth. It wasn't, peace, be still. It's just water and wine. But that glimpse into his power revealed his glory. And what's significant is that if Jesus cares about there being something to drink at a party, then he probably cares about the individual and specific details in my own life every day. What job I take. How I talk to those who report to me. How much I give to the Lord. How much I share with others. How I treat those who believe differently than I do how I talk to the umpire at my kid's ball game. See, Jesus still uses everyday simple things to reveal his glory. It may not be water and wine. This past week for 1,600 students, it was water and sand at Bible and Beach. And if you talk to any of those teens, they would tell you that Jesus revealed his glory to them in a variety of ways. I just walked in from being over at their Bible and Beach celebration service with a lot of the students and with a lot of parents, and they are on fire for Christ. And 159 students experienced the spiritual miracle of having their past washed away and the Holy Spirit taking up residency in their heart. And because Jesus revealed himself to them, their lives in the future will be dramatically different because of what happened this week. And Jesus wants to reveal himself to you Sometimes quietly, sometimes dramatically, but, but that's what he wants. He wants for you to believe in him and realize who he is and what he can do in your life and through your life. And when things go wrong, the Lord may, may be drawing you to him for the very first time. For others of you, he may be drawing you back to him again. But it's not just at Easter and Christmas. And it's not just in cemeteries and hospitals. And it's not just at police stations and sanctuary steps. It's when you're on vacation at the beach. It's when you have that difficult boss at work each day. It's when you're reaching out to encourage a neighbor who's going through a tough time. It's when you're having a bad day. He is an everyday God involved in your everyday life, and he deeply cares about you. You see, Jesus went to the cross for a very noble and loving purpose, and he stayed there for a reason. He stayed on the cross when he could have come down from the cross because he knew that only by him staying on the cross could his perfect sacrifice pay for my sins. To put it another way, he got his blood all over my stuff, all over my pride, all over my lust, all over my selfishness. And you guys blood all over your stuff too. All over your jealousy and your anger and your apathy. And his blood covers over all of our sins. Why did he stay on the cross? Because Hebrews 9.22 says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It wasn't his time when he changed water into wine. But it was his time when he stayed on the cross. And at Calvary, when things appeared to have gone wrong, on closer observation, we learned that God was simply showing up, drawing us to Jesus. And when you take your final breath, the only thing that will matter is if you have allowed Christ and his glory to be revealed in you, and you've made him the Lord of your life. Jesus says, In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. May we listen to the words of Mary when she gave that advice. Do whatever he says. Let's pray. Father, you have a way of showing up in the strangest of places to get our attention, to reveal your glory. And Lord, you are never late, 
and you're never early. You're always right on time. So we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, be an everyday God for our everyday lives, one who is interested in impacting our lives on a daily basis because we are yielding and surrendering ourselves to you. May we take up our cross and follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity uh, to make a decision for Christ today. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus, this, this could be your day. And you believe that Jesus is God's son and you confess that you're not perfect and that he is and uh, you repent of that. You humble yourself at Christian baptism. You're acting out the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What makes Jesus different from every other world leader is the fact that uh, he's not in his grave. And then you, being resurrected by the resurrected king, uh, you live on his behalf. You can start that journey today. There are others of you who, uh, who need to make this church your home and say, I, I want to be a member of this church. And there are some of you who, who really need prayer today. You're going through a difficult time, and it's just when things go wrong, and that's what's going on. We have a lot of people in our first step room who would love to pray with you. So whatever your need is, uh, you can meet me down front if you want as we stand and as we worship.